your time. That means a lot to our whole team. So thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Chambers and I work with the Cherokee Office of Economic Development and our amazing team is all here minus Misty, our fearless leader. Um, she's in California, right? Correct. Yes. On business. On business. That's okay. That was personal, but it is business. <laughs> um, so we do economic development focused on the entire county of Cherokee. So uh, everything from product development to things that are in our Cherokee 75 corporate park on 92, like uh, Adidas and Alpha, Woodstock Furniture Outlets, Distribution Center, Yanmar, MSK, and several others, um, J for Living, um, to growing existing companies and businesses that are here in, wow, I almost said Statesboro. Okay. Let me start out. To entrepreneurship, to film and media, as well as talent development and work. So we work, we focus on everything that involves the future of our county as far as jobs and economic development. And that's where this story, you've probably heard this over the last six months or more, but this is our new um, strategy and our story. It's called Cherokee by Choice, and it's our initiative focused on finding out the stories in our community as to why people have made Cherokee their choice. Uh, most of us are here intentionally. 78% of us still commute out of the county for their work, which is uh, a little discouraging. And so a big part of our office is to try to change that narrative and change those numbers, convince people to work in the community, to not just live and play here, but also work here as well. And so if you have a story to tell, we want to hear it. We really do. And we want our audience and our community to hear your story as well. So if you haven't done this already, I would encourage you to go on the Facebook, go on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Google+, Plus whatever your favorite social media platform is, use the hashtag Cherokee by Choice and tell us your Cherokee by Choice story, especially for those of us who've been here in a long time. So we'd love to hear it. Um, and so out of that, a big part of our entrepreneurship initiatives is, is our Fresh Start Cherokee program, which is our programming brand designed to build programs just like the Lunch Circuit, to create resources for entrepreneurs, um, to create a community, to give them space like the circuit to work in, and to really help them get over the hurdles that they might have from starting or growing their business. So examples of that, of course, are this program here, the Launch Circuit. Uh, this is our passion, is to wave the banner of entrepreneurship across the entire county with stories, with gathering people together around food. We do that once a month with a new entrepreneur. One Million Cups is another example of that program. We meet twice a month here at the circuit. Then we hit the road, we have free coffee, we bring people together. We hear from a new entrepreneur, stands on stage, and presents their company, and asks for help with their challenges from the community. And then an example of another one is Creative Problem Solvers. This is a group we've been doing for almost two years now. It's kind of a brain trust of local entrepreneurs that get together in a room, and they're not satisfied with just networking. They want to talk about what keeps them up at night, what makes them get up in the morning, what are the challenges they have, and how do they help each other. So it's really more wrapped around the entrepreneurs themselves and less about the problems they're trying to solve. And so it's been a pretty fascinating group. And then of course, uh, for those of you who might be new, I was talking with Brian and uh, JR a little earlier, but <clears throat> some of these guys played basketball here years ago. And so long before Chat Tech renovated this campus and partnered with us. First and second grade? Wow. <laughs> 10 years ago, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's great hearing those kind of stories. We appreciate that because it, it makes us proud of the history that happened in this building and then seeing the difference in what it is today. So this is the circuit. It's a place for entrepreneurs to work, to have an office, a desk. It's a place for students of Chat Tech to gather and study, and it's a place for people to come in and just convene and collaborate. And we're excited about our coffee shop. should be ready in about four weeks, so stay tuned for that. Be, yes, thank you, Dan. I expect to see you in the first one in line. Um, so just some examples of the people that work in our community from um, app developers to service providers to accountants, um, people who have, re uh, who have retail products, um, folks who are just working remote instead of working from home or a coffee shop, as well as filmmakers, storytellers, they kind of run the whole gamut of industries. Those people work out of the space uh, several days a week or come here a couple times a month to, to be a part of the community. And then of course we couldn't do this, any of this in this space or in these programs without our partners in the circuit, our office, the Economic Development Officer at Woodstock, and of course Chat Tech being a big part of that. Special thanks to, to the Woodstock 
to the Inwood Stock brand, and, and Dan's here this morning, if you guys have more questions about what that brand is, it's a community of professionals, business owners, innovators from around the Woodstock area, and it's really, it's a, an impressive gathering of people. Um, who else is here? David. David, thank you. David Potts. So if you guys have questions about that, there's programs, there's events, we partner with them on, on different things as well, so in Woodstock, we appreciate you guys. Um, and then real quick, especially for those of you who are new, kind of why we do the lunch circuit, it's three reasons. We, we love stories, and I think most of us do. Stories impact us, we can relate to them, they create empathy, um, they inspire us. So we love hearing people's stories, we love gathering around the table intentionally to create community. Um, I think if we were to do this all online, uh, simulcast, it would be a very different culture than if we came together in one room, that's why we get together. And then of course, just the focus on entrepreneurship. Uh, we think that entrepreneurship is a powerful, um, catalyst for economic development in our area. I've heard some people call it economic gardening because it's, it's economic development at the grassroots level, right? It's literally planting seeds and watering and fertilizing and cultivating the ground and coming together as a community to see if this thing will grow. So we are passionate about entrepreneurship. Um, and because we like being tech savvy, for those of you who have a smartphone, we've started to do this the last couple months, but if you are a shy person and you don't want to ask questions at the end of JR or Brian, um, you can go to slido.com right now and enter in the hashtag lunch circuit and submit a question throughout the time that I'm talking with them as well as to the very end. So please feel free to do that if you want to and I'll pick from some of those questions toward the end. So for our introverts in the room or for those who are really snarky, <laughs> David Potts, uh, you can <laughs> enter questions through that. Okay, sorry. I'm just saying, there's always one in the room, so. It's kind of a dangerous invitation because we've got some really interesting questions, but I won't get into that. Um, so, I want to tell you real quick about uh, JR and Brian and Woodstock Furniture Outlet, and then invite them up. We'll do about 30 minutes of Q&A, and then we'll let you guys ask some questions at the end. So, Woodstock Furniture Outlet started with an idea in 1988, 31 years ago. That's very exciting. Um, it started with an idea to sell good used furniture at affordable prices, and they've kept that vision for 30 plus years. Uh, they have grown to about 200 staff, I believe. Um, seven locations, I, I didn't even know this until recently. Um, three locations of their furniture and mattress outlets in Woodstock, Ackworth, Dallas, Hiram, and Rome. And then an additional four locations of their mattress outlet, which started in Canton in 2011, and has expanded into Kennesaw, Douglasville, and the Buckhead area of Atlanta. So oh, wow. truly impressive that you guys have expanded this brand and uh, you've stayed focused on customers as your number one priority for so many years. Um, and so we want to invite you guys up now, and if you guys would give a hand to uh, JR and Brian. Friendly. Mm -hmm. okay. One word. One word. Well, I did. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
I forgot. I didn't hear that part. You didn't hear it? <laughs> it's hard. I'm all over the board. I mean, that, that works. Three words. He's <laughs> all over the board. All over. Unfriendly? <laughs> well, it's like that. Um, what is the only way to drink coffee? Black. Black. All right, this is going to be too easy. This is getting a little personal. A little personal here, so let's. Come over here, mom. All right, what mattress brand do you prefer to sleep on? Tempur Pedic. These are not official endorsements, are they? No. Okay. Tempur Pedic. But that is an official endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How do you start the day? How do y'all start your day each day? I usually start on the treadmill for about 20 minutes in the morning, and uh, I read, uh, do my scripture reading for the, about the first 12 minutes, and then I will try to run the last seven or eight and then cool down. Wow. All right. Yeah, I'm up at uh, 4:55 and do a little scripture, and then I'm at LA Fitness at six at Woodstock for Town Lake. So uh, Monday through Friday. 4.55 a.m. I'm there at 6. But I start my day early. We, wow. both, we both start early. Yeah. So. All right. Favorite type of music? It's, uh, I guess it'd be uh, gospel. I like all of it. All of it. All over the board, right? All over the yeah. board. Yeah. <laughs> Do y'all have a favorite Southern comfort food? Pinto beans, <laughs> cornbread, right? Cornbread, right? <laughs> you said country food, southern comfort food, or favorite food? Oh, yeah. Catfish. <laughs> yeah. Fried catfish. Fried catfish. There you go. I like yeah. it with cornbread and pinto yeah. beans on the side. Well, buttermilk. Buttermilk and cornbread. Yeah, good. I like it. Good. We're getting very specific here. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, this is making really holy <laughs> um, I wonder if, since we're talking about food here for a second, if you would settle a debate that we had a few minutes ago with some of our team. Do what right. again? We had a debate a few minutes ago with several of our team members about whether Waffle House or Huddle House is better. Oh, what? Waffle House. 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 I have been to the other than no. here. Okay. <laughs> All right, what do you do for fun? We try to RV some, uh, not as much as we'd like, but I think we enjoy that about as much as anything. Well, yeah, we got a five-year-old grandson who thinks he lives in Disney, so we have to go down there every three months to get him a fix. <laughs> we, uh, I, I like to run a lot, and then uh, we RV a lot with them and without them. When I, when, I, when I can get off of work. <laughs> All right, just the last couple here, and then we'll jump into a little bit more story. Um, the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Most dangerous thing? I'm not sure he's probably driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, then mine would be easy riding with him. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. What car are you driving in so I can drive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to never RV with your family here. Um, it's 45 foot, yes. his RV is, oh, really? so you ought to ride with him in that. <laughs> uh, do y'all have a favorite slang saying? Mm. There's no reason not to buy today. <laughs> How do we do it? Yeah. How do we do it? Yeah. Mark it down. I love it. Mark yeah. it down. Yeah. Mark it down. Well, I appreciate y'all here with us with some of those questions. Kind of jump into it. So I want to learn a little bit more about y'all's family and where you grew up and what life was like, just to kick it off. 
Okay, uh, I guess it's some 70 years ago I started school here, I guess, and uh, I'm probably one of the only few people left around, maybe there's a few that's been downtown Woods Woodstock in a mule and wagon. I remember when I was a kid, we'd bring a Bella Cotton over here in a mule and wagon. I think the gym was just over the hill out yonder in the hollow before you get to Dixie Inn, I think. But anyway, uh, we lived out on, at the time, uh, Ragstall Road and Trickham, I think. We, we had to move every time the rent came to you, so we, <laughs> you know, we moved around a lot. But uh, anyway, after I finished the second grade here, we moved to uh, Shelford Road and I started to Blackwell Elementary. And we managed to stay there until I got through Blackwell and went to Sprayberry. And, Stayed at Sprayberry until my senior year, and then we moved to Ackworth. So I actually finished at North Cobb. But I was never a senior anywhere. I failed so many classes. I had to go to summer school and finally got through. I don't even know how I did, but uh, I did manage to get out. So uh, <clears throat> immediately after, uh, well, I'll go, I'll back up a minute. In, I guess it was my junior year in 1960, her brother came by. I was down on. Uh, Hicks Road there towards Mapleton, picking apples uh, in an orchard down there, I think. It was making 15 cents a bushel, or that's what they were paying, and I knew I wasn't a real good picker, but her brother drove up one afternoon, so let's go join the Navy. Well, I didn't know what the Navy was, but I figured it'd be picking apples, so I threw my sack down and jumped in the car. And we went to join the Naval Reserve, which uh, this is in 60, is a six year obligation, two years active, and so on. Did they pay more than 15 cents? Well, very little, but I'll get to that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> right after high school, we left and went to Jacksonville. We had two years of active duty, and uh, we ended up on a carrier there out of Mayport, the Chamber Lodge. We ran up down the East Coast for a year and a half or so. and. Went to New York for six months and, and dry dock, but uh, we, I got out of the Navy in 63, and she'd been chasing me for two or three years, wanting to get married soon, so I managed to put her off till sometime <laughs> in 64. But in the interim, uh, I, got to, I got a job at Sears down on Costa Some of y'all may have heard of it or been there, I don't know, but anyway, I think in the Navy I made $78 a month when I got out, so I wasn't making a whole lot. It wasn't a whole lot better than picking apples probably, but Sears wasn't paying much better. And I think at $59 a week when I think we, I started down there and uh, never made a whole lot more than that, but back then they'd give us two and a half cent raises. Any of y'all ever had a two and a half cent raise? You know, they give two and a half cent raises. So one of the guys said he uh, he got one of them two and a half cent raises and he says, boss says now, don't you tell nobody about this. And he said, you don't have to worry, I'm just as damn ashamed of as you are. <laughs> you know, so that was the kind of deal. But anyway, I stayed there 23 years. And uh, we got married in 64. This is my wife over here. And uh, then we started having little ones. And he, was, he was the second, he was number two, Brian. And uh, I guess Darlene was born in 65, and he's 68, and Angie was 71. So then we lived in Marietta at that time. So we decided that we, the house we were in was 800 square feet or something. I don't know. It wasn't big. But the guy we rented it from initially decided to sell it to us. Uh, so in the interim, we bought that house for 8000 and we sold it four or five years later for 12 or 13 and moved to Cherokee Estates up here in 71. I think we paid twenty two nine for that house. It was, a, it was a big house, 1,400 feet, right? We thought it was a big house. But anyway... I love how you're helping with the details. It's, it's good. Yeah, she's trying to help me out here. But anyway... Uh, <clears throat> The kids grew up here when Woodstock went to all the local, what was it, Chapman and Booth and Etowah yeah. High School. They all, they all graduated from uh, Etowah. And uh, so in long story short, in 87, I, uh, Sears was shutting down our department, so I left. And a year later, decided uh, I had been selling some of the catalog returns to other dealers over the years. 
you know, the returns to other people that was in business. And after being off about a year, my old boss, uh, he called me and said, why don't I start buying some and open something up? So, we, so I decided to do that down here on Old Highway 5. We're, uh, what's it close to? It's about a half a mile south of with a 92 intersection on the right. And I, it's about all. So we stayed there a year and a half. We opened up junk, selling anything we could buy. And a lot of it we shouldn't have, but we did. And uh, anyway, then we moved over, I believe it was 1990, over to Bell's Ferry in 92 there in the old Big Star. And we had 25,000 feet there. And Brian, he had to buy a load of one-armed sofas to help fill it up, because uh, we didn't have nothing much to go in, you know. But he had uh, got hooked up with this guy in Spartanburg and started buying one-armed sofas. And it worked out pretty good, I think. Uh, we didn't know if it'd sell or not, but it turned out yeah, that people would buy a one-armed sofa. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, <laughs> cheap enough. Yeah, cheap enough. Cheap enough. Cheap. Yeah, but cheap. in the last two or three years, uh, <laughs> he, you, uh, bought, we bought and sold how many one-armed climbers? Or no arm? But I'm, I'm having trouble envisioning a one-arm sofa. Is this yeah. just getting pushed up against the wall? Well, table you put a table two. on the other end or something. There's, there's a lot of ways. <laughs> but when they're $50 a piece or whatever, you find the way of yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Anyway, long as we, we actually didn't get into a total of home furnishings until 94. We were still piddling. We had a fire in 92 out there. Still don't know how it started. But uh, after the fire, we just never did uh, find our niche again. It was kind of, we were doing great before the fire came, but after that, it was a struggle. We just wasn't, wasn't doing too good. And uh, so we we changed a couple of times. We had a few pieces of furniture, and I'd get mad if something bad returned or something. I'd say, let's sell it all off. Let's just put in clothes or whatever we can find. And we'd do that for a year, and then we'd go back to furniture. But anyway, this last time, we closed up for two weeks, or sold everything off, closed up for a couple of weeks, and then reopened in the home furnishing business. And as it's turned out, it's been the, the best thing we've ever done. It's been, been good to us. We've been blessed. We've had some tough times. It's never, uh, never an easy business. It's always a struggle. You start every day unemployed. You know, you ain't, you ain't selling nothing to ring in the cash register. It don't matter about anything else. It don't matter how pretty it is or how good it is. If you don't ring the register, you won't be there long. So we never had any cash. We always we had inventory, but we'd all usually our cash would be pretty low. So. Harold Westbrook, so everybody, anybody know Harold Westbrook? Used to be Stacy's wholesale up in Camp. They, he helped us a lot getting started. He sold us a lot of. In the back then, he was in the wholesale business, and he'd sell us. He sold us quite a few things that we did well on. But uh, he always told us. He said you could be out of one or the other, but you couldn't be out of both. You know, if you run out of inventory and you're out of money, you're you're out of business. But as long as you got one or the other, you can kind of hang on. So consequently, over the years, uh, all the cash that we've ever had was tied up in inventory. You know, pretty much. We, uh, we never have figured out exactly how much to buy to free up cash. We always buy stuff we don't need with money we don't have. You know, we've done that all our lives. So consequently, the bank really owned the store. We just worked there, you know, to take it. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I don't know. It's been a good ride. We've had a lot of a uh, lot of funny situations. Uh, we had a lady a few years ago that bought a red leather sofa. A couple of years later, she called complaining because it dyed her little poodle red. And the white poodle is dyed it dyed her all red. <laughs> Pink or something, and she came in, and I told her she should have got a sofa the same color of her dog or whatever. Anyway, I don't know what we did with her, but we probably swapped it out. I don't know, the dog or the sofa one, I don't know which. <laughs> anyway, and then we had a, a guy about what a month ago. He was 
out of Sofa and had five years, was it, or four? Been put, started building? Six. Six years. Six years had it that long? Six years. And he called complaining that he, somebody sold it to him and told him it was leather and it was bonded or whatever it was, wasn't supposed to peel. So I think, what we uh, what did he end up offering him for that? Give him a credit for trading it in. And uh, I forgot what it was. But anyway, at first he wasn't real happy about it and complaining, but I told him the smartest thing he ever done was buy it from us. Because if he bought it from anybody else, they wouldn't give him nothing. You know, really, yeah. that's the truth. Yeah. So we finally, when he come in, I think it kind of finally guy. sunk in and he was, he was okay. You know, he realized that, you know, he, he was lucky to get anything for a six-year-old soul. Yeah. Did you give him a pink poodle? Well, <laughs> But anyway, folks, I, I don't know. We, uh, we don't take a lot of credit for being where we are. To God be the glory. So uh, I'm just glad to be here. I, I can't say and tell you anything that I did or whatever that would have made us uh, what people, some people call successful. So we all, we've been told that being successful is not how much money you got, it's how much you owe. So we're very successful. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story. I want to ask a, a couple follow-up questions too, because um, we interact with a lot of entrepreneurs at programs and as well as in the circuit space here. Um, you talk about how you define success. How would y'all define what an entrepreneur is? A lot of people have ideas. What do you think it is that makes a person an entrepreneur? I think you you got to be a server. You got to serve the people, basically. And uh, I think one of the biggest things you got to do what you say you'll do. You know, you got to be there when you say you'll be there. You got to do what you say you'll do. I mean, we always got to answer the question: Why would anybody come to our stores? Because you can buy everything we got somewhere else for the most part. So yeah. we're always fine. Why would you come here? And what you know, he summed it up the other day in a meeting with some folks about what do we think we're good at. And he said we're good at saying yes to the customer. And you can't say yes to everything. I mean, you can't offer me five bucks for that, and I got two hundred yeah. in it. But you got to say, like he says, say yes. You say no, but they think you said yes because of the way you can uh, you can actually uh, say it. But you have to but spend all, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to figure out. Why would anybody do business with me? Why, why do I think I got something somebody's going to want and that we can make a profit and stay in business? And uh, all of us that got businesses, our number one assets are people. It's not the inventory, it's not our real estate. It's so does good furniture sell itself? No. No, it's all, I mean, we're all in the people business, so it's all relational because now, Unfortunately, everything we sell, pretty much, you don't even have to leave your bed, your house. You can just click, 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 have it delivered. If you don't like it, send it back. So we're, we, it's got to be about the relationships. And why would somebody want to come back over and over and over and buy from Diane or us or whoever? And we can't deal with every customer at every store every day. So we have to try to develop our people to treat them like we were going. We would treat them if we were there every day. And that's a huge struggle when you got a store in Buckhead or Hiram or Jerome. And well, so, you know what I like about those stores? When you walk in, the people wait for you. You walk in, and they're all willing to help you out. You know how to go find somebody. They're always right there in front of you to, to help you out. And that's the best. That's to me. I, I, I went in there and laid by some chairs. Boom. I was in and out. I knew what I wanted in 15, 20 minutes. But yeah. it was just somebody was going to help you walk in the door. Yeah. Some, some people like that and some don't. So, you know, you have to kind of... <laughs> Yeah, when they come in, we, when they're on the phone and they never take the phone from yeah. here, you, you get a pretty good idea. <laughs> they don't want nobody talking to them. They, they just want. If you ever see me come in the store on my phone, it's yeah. because yeah. I probably have my wife. Yeah. So I don't have to start buying things. No. You know, in the back. Um, what about speak to, to being a family business? Because I know that sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it's a mess. How do y'all make that work? Uh, I'm not sure we've done a good job. Probably, I've always said that probably a family business is the biggest threat to a family and a family is the biggest threat to a family business. Yep. And I think that's true. So you just gotta, 
I don't know. You just uh, you got to learn how to apologize pretty quick. You know, you got to say I'm sorry a lot of times. You know, because uh, it gets pretty heated sometimes. And uh, we got a coach now. We pay. Yeah, we have to pay a coach now to keep us separated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah
You know, I don't know that we really ever spent a lot of time focused on growth. I mean, we never have. every day. I mean, every day we want to do more than we did the year yeah. before. It's always a only looking at every day. I mean, we do have to plan out budgets for the whole year and this and that, but our focus is usually only today. And if we make today and beat last year, then we're going to be zero the next morning. And we're going to try to do the best we can do the next morning. Because every day we open the doors, we're zero. You got no sales, you're starting from scratch. But um, this warehouse is a huge blessing. I mean, we've needed it forever. You know, because all we are really is a logistics company. We get it in, we get it out, and we need to do it at the lowest cost possible. How big is the warehouse there? It's the uh, first phase is 133. So we, we wanted it where uh, Ethan then worked it out. We get enough land that if we ever do continue just to grow and need more, we hopefully wouldn't have to move for that. Should carry us 20, 25 years if we never need to add that big. So it's awesome. Uh, tell me, because as you grow and expand, I'm curious to understand some of the decisions that go into when to grow and when to expand. So like when in 2011, when y'all decided to launch a new venture and, and open a mattress outlet store for the first time in Canton, what went into that decision? Was there a market need? Did you, was it like a gut thing? I mean, how did that work? Chris McCurry was really the only reason we did. I think he had some space and he offered us a deal where you only paid rent on what you sold. So we felt like it wasn't a huge expense, wasn't a huge risk. It was a month to month more or less, so uh, why not? You know, and it took, what was that, it took five years at least to uh, begin to start doing fairly good business there. And then we, how long ago we moved over 20? A year and a half. Yeah. Year and a half ago, moved over to 20, and it's uh, it's about double the business moving over to 20. But uh, of course, you double your expense, you know. So anyway, uh, not a whole lot of planning went into that. But the other mattress stores, pretty much, uh, I'm not real proud of the fact, but I guess I'm the one that instigated opening the other stores when uh, Tempur-Pedic and T Tempur Sealy out of falling out with, with uh, the mattress firm people. They quit carrying the product, they pulled it. What we thought, I thought, is an opportunity maybe to grow that business and maybe open some mattress stores. But if you ask me again today if I want to open any, I'm not sure that I'd be <laughs> I say, no, I think we don't need any mattress stores. So, I mean, it's probably two or three of them are starting to, start to do some pretty good business, but uh, it's been a, been a struggle, yeah. But uh, well, Brian, you had mentioned too earlier. <clears throat> we were talking offline about as your company grows, especially thirty years in, the challenge of sustaining that culture, right? The people, the culture, and then you say at a point now where you've got culture and you've had culture, but how do you define what the culture is and what the values are? Yeah, speak to that? yeah, that's the, that's the biggest issue because if you go to the store over here that we all work at, then that's kind of been the culture. But then when he wanted to open other stores, now how do you how do you make walking in our hiring store feel like our main store, our Rome store? So the same coach we hired for the family, that he's a he's worked with Chick-fil-A and uh, Air Force and got a lot of great clients, but uh, we're surprised we could afford him. But anyway, he's uh, this is part of what he's really helping us this year. We're not trying not to we're not gonna open those doors. We're just gonna work on us because we got a great culture, but we got to figure out how do you define it and how do you uh, how do you teach it to where, where you can to, repeat it. Where you can repeat it because Chick Fil A, I think we all would agree, is probably one of the best. We go to Chick Fil A almost anywhere is a same great experience. And so that's our that's a huge challenge for all of us. If you have multiple, how do you hire them and teach them and you know, and then the family, how does everybody know what their roles are and not cross over and start causing all the chaos? But the culture is huge. How do you do that? And that's what we're learning. And with even an hour before we got here, we just started that. We voted to start that lean Toyota uh, production system, basically lean as a company. I mean, that's a never-ending journey. We just decided this morning to 
embark on. So that's going to be probably the biggest thing we've ever done. Part of that is fire and sloppy. Yeah. So part of lean is uh, fire and sloppy. Sloppy is probably our highest paid uh, employee, but we don't know where who he is, so we can't fire him. We can't fire him. <laughs> you know, so we get, but sloppy is still he's still there. He's still on paper. Haven't been able to find him yet. Right? No, we haven't found Sloppy, yeah. but we know he's there. He's making more money than anybody. <laughs> yeah, he's a bit high, but he costs me more than anybody else, for sure. That's interesting. How, so what are some of the values that y'all are based on? What, what are some of those core tenets? Well, we try to, uh, our goal is to, first of all, we want to honor God and take care of our employees and serve the people that just uh, be a good citizen in the community. Well, we look at it all. I mean, nobody owns nothing. I mean, if you're a Christian that happens to have a business, then we're we're just stewards over his company. So we're highly held highly accountable for you know the resources, and we started with nothing. I mean, he borrowed twenty five thousand from the bank to start. So. Uh, we just yeah, we kind of really approach it with an inverted pyramid. We're at the bottom, and you know our frontline folks. So our whole job is to make it where they can actually execute with uh, our all of our customers. You know, at the top front line. But uh, being a steward, that's really and it makes it so freeing because we're not worried about the money or it ain't like we started with nothing. Yeah. So if we lose it, we did we got paid for thirty years and. We've had we a good know, job. We had a great right. job, yeah. fun, and yeah. but it ain't ours anyway. Y'all aren't closing today at four thirty. No, no, he, he works six days a week. Yeah, he can't I'm, already get no. a day off. No, I work a lot on Sunday. Yeah, he's off Sunday. I want to tell y'all something real quick, and please don't think I'm bragging. I don't have anything, but just to give you a little bit of insight, I worked at Sears. Y'all heard me twenty three years, right? And in one year in this business, I paid more income tax than I made in the 23 years that I worked at Sears. So that'll tell you how little they paid me over the years. It does not have anything to do with how much I made because we never have cash. It's always in inventory. So we look at each other and say, how in the world do we owe this much taxes? We ain't got no money, never have had. But, you know, they're going to tax you on inventory and whatever, whatever. So makes it look like you made a ton of money. You know, they want a ton of money. But in the reality, the way out of you didn't make hardly nothing. You didn't have nothing left when you got through. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that in in case some of you are, you know, you wondered about where the money goes. It's just for us, we've just never been able to uh, accumulate a lot of cash. You know, the Uncle Sam, he wasn't, he'd never let us have any money. And, uh, so uh, anyway, it's just day to day. We're this day. We get a paycheck every two weeks, hopefully, and uh, that's the way it is. <clears throat> we can't something. ever retire. We owe too much. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do something for thirty, I mean, thirty years is a long time to stay committed to one thing, especially nowadays in our culture where you know, people jump ship every couple of years. Um, how do y'all? Well, do y'all enjoy your work? And then if you do, how do you stay in a place where you continue to enjoy what you do? Yeah, that's easy. I, I was just sharing this with our team. We were just meeting. Uh, my philosophy is if I can enjoy 70 to 80% of my job, then I'm at the right place in the right job. Then that's sustainable. But if you're not, you ain't in a sustainable situation. But but I'm not done yet. But no. the way, yeah, but the way. <laughs> He'll probably say I take too much time off, but uh, but after you've done it 30 years, we if we're not out of town, we're working six days a week over there. So uh, the way I stay loving it is I have to get away from them, you know, and take enough time off, and that's the way that they want me to be gone because I'm a lot nicer and enjoy them more. But if you just stay there in the room, I'm not the type that's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna wait till I retire to enjoy life. I want to enjoy it now. Every day, I don't want to be living for no retirement. So, cause I love when you love what you do, it ain't like work. At least eighty percent. And the reason I'm still there, other than uh, 
owing so much. I can't golf and I'm too sorry to fish. So, you know, I, I might as well work. But speaking of golf, we did play in the golf sheriff's tournament Monday. And if any of you be interested, I think we were 17 under, right? Yeah. 55 or yeah. something. But we had two ringers, it wasn't us. We, we'd still be out there hacking if we'd have had to hit our ball and finally get it in the hole. We'd still be there, I guess. But anyway, that was, uh, it was a fun, fun time. But uh, no, I don't golf and I'm too sorry to fish on my way to work. She won't let you stay home. If no, I, can't, I ain't gonna stay home. And, uh, so if she ain't going nowhere, I'll just be at work. There you go. All right. Yeah. Work. What have y'all learned? What are some things you might have learned by yourself in this journey? I've learned pretty much that I'm ADD pretty much. I'm ADD. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you just, I think, uh, I think I've learned to put, uh, put the people for you know, put the people first. Our employees and our customers, put them first. Yeah, I like the uh, relationship building with our staff, just to be in the store, in the warehouse, just wherever we got them and actually getting to know them. Because that's, uh, to me, that's a, beside the customers I love, but then the staff working with them, and actually getting to know them. Cool. We don't tell ever, we hate the word owner, so we hate to use it. We hate that word, but uh, but they know who you are. And if you spend time and sit down with them, and you know you remember their mom had surgery a month ago, that just it means a lot to them. So that that's the part I get a lot out. Of. Well, one more question, and then I'm going to turn it over to to everybody here for the last 15 or 20. Um, but what would y'all say to the next generation? Uh, because we meet a lot of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs that want to launch something or build a product or a business, but maybe they feel like they don't know where to start. Um, or they feel like they're not equipped. Like, who are they to actually to make this happen? What, what piece of advice would y'all give? Gosh, uh, just be willing to work, I think, and believe in what you're doing. and. Uh, don't don't do it for the money, you know. Yeah. Don't do it for the money. You just uh, you just need to enjoy what you're doing. And one thing about business is, if you start to have a little little success, I think the biggest problem with a lot of people they take too much out of the business. You know, they take too much out, and I think that's the reason for so many business failures. To me, I think more so than a lot of. Uh, Slow down in a lot of cases, people take too much out of business. But anyway, again, we just proud to be here. Yeah. Still. Brian, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's good. Um, well, I want to, uh, let's go to you guys and we'll see um, what questions y'all have. I'll pull up the app in a minute, but you want to kick this off, Jennifer? Yes, I would like to hear about your foundation that you started. Why did you start that? And what are your goals for the foundation? You would ask that question. You betcha. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, well, our giving's kind of, well, our giving, we've tried to look at a lot of it like a tithe on our business. So we, that part's unpublished and not, we don't, we don't want anybody to know what we're doing. But then years ago, the, our financial folks said, well, Fidelity's got this deal where you can go and just set the foundation up, put all the money in there and deduct it, and then you just still can send all your tithe into all the places that are legal, 5013C, and uh, then everything else is be accumulating to actually do some more publicized or even, we're not real big on getting credit for forgiven anything uh, but we we do just want to continue to grow that too we love we love even our employees got a benevolence fund they put money in every payday we match it they've got the account at one of the banks and they just manage the little board manages just meeting needs for people 
but it's all not, you don't know about it. And sending a bed to somebody or paying a light bill. Or, or and over the years, it's been oh, 100, 150, 200,000 they've been sewing into things, but it's not, you know, that's just their deal that they do, that we match. But, uh, but we've done a few things. So you're saying that the employees themselves That's separate. Have a they have a little benevolence fund they, that they do. They, they have a benevolence That's fund. We've done it for about 15, 18 years, but they've, like I said, if but that's somebody, not part of your family. Not part of it. That's okay. just something that they do. We like I say every paycheck, whoever wants to give five, ten bucks, and then mm -hmm. whatever that amount is, then we match it, and then it goes in that account. That's so fabulous. That's, that's the fun part. Thank you. So, one quick story. There's a guy. If I call his name, some of you may may know him. But I don't even know if he's still around Woodstock, but the prime was playing pee wee basketball here at this gym. He would done a lot of refereeing here. And uh, over the years, he just had some, you know, he struggled, I seem like a nice guy. Just, but anyway, about five years ago, he kept coming. He'd come by the store and he needed, uh, I know one time it was his rent paid or car paid or whatever. So we, we helped him two or three times. So the next time he came in, I told, I told him, I said, now this is a loan. This is not a gift. We want you, you're going to pay this back. We knew we loaned him money, we wouldn't see him again. And so far, that's probably been three years that I, when it worked, I don't think he's been back. So as long as we were giving him it all, he kept he'd come back every month or two. So we finally had to make it a loan and he quit coming. So we've tried, we've done that a few times. Tell them it's a loan and then they, they go on to marry well. So. But yeah, I, I would hope when I say this and I'm telling the truth, we don't have many people that walk in that door or call that need help, you know, whatever it is. I hope 99% of them are able to do something. Now, I think that's true. I may, I, I may not know, but I think that's, we that's a situation. We only help them one time. We that's try to only help them once. Time. Sometimes we keep coming long. back. Yeah, one time. <laughs> and employees are exempt. They can't. They can't no, get any we don't money. Their families. There's nothing. It's our responsibility to help an employee, yeah. not the yeah. employee. Because then they quit giving. Because so and so. Yeah. Right. Taking the money. Yeah. So. Anyway. But anyway, it's been good. And uh, like I say, we try to always say yes if we can. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Damn. Oh. Go ahead. I just wondered, any future plans for the warehouse? I know y'all expanded back a little bit in the back. So y'all move the distribution center over to a new location. Are y'all going to build a bigger showroom back there? What's going to go on in the back? Well, we have expanded into that area. Uh, back in, what was it, October, we bought a huge amount of closeouts, and they came in when? About the first of the year, the November, and then there's some of them came in December. A lot of closeouts, so we filled up a lot of that space with closeouts. And uh, at some point, we would we'd like to remodel the whole place and start over. Well, we actually go on next Wednesday, Thursday in Tennessee and Kentucky. Ten of us to look at two stores that uh, have just gone through a re big remodel projects. So. That's uh, that's what we're doing next week. Yeah, we want to remodel from the tent. The county is making us get rid of the tent before we can get any more permits. So it's supposed to be up for 10 days, and that yeah. was 15 years 15 ago. 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, so the fire marshal said no more permits yeah. until the tent's gone. And so that's the backlog on that permit violation is going to be so, like, uh, yeah. Well, fire marshal didn't. We're just gonna all start fresh, so I guess after Labor Day we're gonna take the tent down. But we do want to remodel from the facade, all the tear all the walls out. It's gonna be a big project, so it's so, not gonna happen this year. But it may, hopefully, it may start by the end of the year. Hopefully, so. possibly the permits will be full by the end. Yeah, yeah. You get enough money, yeah. money. Cause we <laughs> we gotta just uh, whatever we do, we gotta just do it out of cash flow. Yeah. You know, so it's just but. The more you buy, the faster we can. Yeah. You've been yeah. doing your part, yeah. though. So. Thank you, David, for supporting me. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. Dan? I mean, I, I don't think there are too many businesses in and around this area 
that have seen kind of the historical growth over the last 20 to 30 years of, of Cherokee County like you guys have. And I think it would also be pretty accurate to say there probably aren't too many other locally owned stores that get as much foot traffic as you guys get. So excluding your Target, your Walmart, your Costco, and maybe the outlet mall, you guys probably get more foot traffic than just about any store in, in and around Cherokee County that's locally owned. So as you've seen the changeover and the growth of the economy of Cherokee County kind of progress in your history, what do you see that the county needs to do so that folks continue to look to you guys for your furniture needs versus looking on their Amazons, their Wayfarers, and other things that there's now so many other options out there? I'm not real sure about what the county needs to do. We pretty much try to concentrate on what we need to do, but... I mean, if the area got... I mean, what people in the county need to do to continue to deal with the sports you guys? Oh, uh, just continue to come in and buy furniture. And by the way, a lot of our growth was fueled by the rooftops. You know, all this construction over the last 20 years or whatever it was. Town Lake started. It's been a huge, huge benefit to us. Because where there's new houses, most people move in, they want new furniture, at least some, and uh, fortunately we've been in a good place to cap capitalize on a lot of that. And Keith over here, if he'll keep seven houses and send them to us, maybe it'll continue to grow, Keith. Do it all my part. Yeah. We, we bought many couches yeah. and they all have two arms. I was yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> we going to buy one of those. Uh, I got all of them for my men's yeah. Right. One I've got all for they're all in my basement, basement at the house. I don't want to to I've got a showroom set up if you want to come. <laughs> Let me mention something about the one arm cows. The first time this guy come down there, we just opened what six months earlier, and I was out of town. And Mike McClure, who's up in Spartanburg, he showed up down at the store there with a truck one, one Saturday. And he had some one arm sofas, and uh, Brian called me about buying them. And I said, Well, whatever, give him a shot. So anyway, that was 30 years ago, and this guy, from time to time, we still buy from him, buy some stuff, he buys a deal every now and then. And, but you gotta watch out when he calls you and say, now I got this such and such, this dining room suit or this living room suit or bedroom, but I'm gonna tell you what, he says, I can only let you have two. I, can, I can't let you have, you know, a truckload, I can only let you have two, so when he tells you that, you best shy away because you probably didn't want to do <laughs> Back to your question though, uh, I mean we we still got all the way, like I say, to find a reason why would y'all even want to shop with us. So the warehouse is helping us, you know, do a much better job carrying more inventory and trying to get it to your house faster. We just, we're testing a deal we launched last Wednesday, a free curbside drop-off deal. If you spend like $5.99 and there's some we're doing our slowest delivery days and there's a 10 piece limit, but to help us compete with online to where if you come by and you pick out, we can just drop it by your garage or driveway in the box and, and it better be free. Just be a free added value versus color. Our full service delivery, we do everything. You know, open it, prep it, put it together, bring it in, set it all up. You know, which a lot of us want the full service and there's no trash, but the folks that want more of the online, we're trying to test a few ways to be more competitive. So. Is that one of the ways you're trying to compete? That's one of the Amazon's ways. Right there. It just, yeah, and I mean, the returns on furniture is such a high uh, return because you have buyer's remorse. You don't know it looks good in the house and then Ruth gets it delivered and it's too big or it's the wrong color. Then, you know, so. There's so, nobody's made a profit selling furniture on the internet. I mean, Wayfair lost 200 million first quarter. Cause you can't, with 30% returns, you can't make a profit. Well, so is that so, why you think some of them are going to the high tech side where you can visualize your furniture in your room, putting on goggles, I mean, you guys have some We online. have, we get so many returns. Cause we give a five day, if you don't like it, you can exchange it and you sit on it and you measured it and you did everything but when it's in your room you don't like it and you spend all this money and why am i stuck with it and that's when you can sit because every couch sits different it's made different the cushions are different the quality is different 
you just can't see that on the on the computer. I mean, we were in Texas the other day with our son and son-in-law, and we're at this market, and I mean, they got the people frying up the steak, you know, making the mashed potatoes, and they got tortillas getting handmade, and a uh, huge grocery store. But it's got, why, well, there's no way I could have experienced buying if I hadn't been in that store. And it, it was an experience, because I wouldn't have known I wanted some fresh tortillas for that mashed potato stuff. Mm -hmm. If I'm just sitting on the computer, I don't know I want it. So that's a, so we got to always try to make it, why would you come on and experience our stores? And whatever business you are in, why they want to do business with you? Right. It's got to be about the experience. It can't be all about price. We're almost out of time. Any other questions from you guys? Y'all mentioned you're uh, moving to the Toyota Inspired Lean process, and then you mentioned there was a discussion about that. Who's involved in those discussions? What, what was that discussion like um, to come to that decision? I was reading a book, the book Lean First, and there's probably about 12 of their uh, upper management staff that was involved in the first four or five meetings. We got our coach we hired for the family. He brought, he introduced me to a lean coach that's here in uh, Kennesaw, whatever. He's a Chick-fil-A operator or was. His. So uh, now that's what he does is coaches a lot of Chick-fil-A's on the lean. So he took me through this two-second lean book over about a month. And so then once I got through, we picked 12 of our folks to go through the book. It's called, it's a great book, Two Second Lean. I mean, they give you tons of videos. I mean, it's, it's uh, the company's out in Washington. It's called Fast Cap, but a really great resource for the lean. But it's a two second lean is the name of the book. But um, so, so we just got finished today and we kicked the coaches out of the room. And we spent about 30, 40 minutes arguing through it. Cause we were going to decide at the end of the day, but we'd rather have a consensus that most people want to hire because it's a huge journey to start yes. and uh so that was uh so now we look we, out of that 12 they picked six and they we let them start in the uh you know setting up the dates and getting started because it's going to be like i say it's it's the biggest thing we've ever started i think which is, but but there's so much waste in everything we do right. and our waste y'all may not want to pay for our waste no more I mean, because all our ways, it ends up in the experience you get and the price you pay. So we've got to cut out, continually cut out ways and improve. One thing the guy did, it got my attention right off, and I, I'm assuming it is right. Now, I didn't, hadn't researched it. But the lean guy said, if Chick-fil-A gives everybody two extra napkins, it costs them $4 million a year. Who would ever thought? I, would you ever thought it? I mean, that's a lot of money for two extra napkins. I think I'm costing Chick Fil A hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just got the well, stuff. That's in the to go window. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Final question, Nathan. Okay. Um, do you expect that you'll modify it in any way for your culture? Probably. Yeah. I would expect to. Yeah. Because we're not manufacturing, and most of the Examples I think were based on manufacturing. Well, I want to honor what I said from earlier. So, then one final question from the app. Um, how did the, and I see Mark's question, I appreciate that. Um, how did the company weather, how did the company weather the most recent recession in the late 2000s? How did y'all, how did y'all handle that? How did you plan for the next one? That's a big question. Lean, that's not Lean is our plan going forward. <laughs> the last one, uh, we closed the store in uh, Canton, which we the building there on Marietta Road, and we eventually sold to somebody. But Furniture Gill, I think, is in there now. So we had a retail store there for several years, three or four uh, different names, but it was a great tax write-off most of the time. I don't know that they ever made any money, but anyway, we closed that store. And we did, we let a few people go, not many, maybe. We lost 50 total. Yeah, but some of them left, I don't know. But uh, we did, we did uh, for the first time, or the only time ever, we cut, had some cutbacks. But I think our, uh, 
our volume, I think, the next year or whatever dropped about 10 million. So we had to do some things to continue to operate. Uh, but uh, well, it's only seemed like only a couple of three years and things started to rebound a little. And, uh, every year it started coming back and picking up momentum. So going forward, uh, this lean thing, if we can uh, really get commit to that and really do it, should have a huge impact. Would y'all give it up for Brian and Jared? Mm -hmm. And again, if you pay for, your, for a ticket, ask for your money back. <laughs> Actually, we're gonna transfer that into one of our chairs. Right? That's <laughs> okay. Okay. So at least if you didn't pay that, you got what yeah. you paid for. Yeah. Well, y'all yeah. hang with me for a second, because I want to share um, okay. uh, two things. Let me get my Thank y'all for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, two real quick things. First, if I don't know if uh, JR or Brian have time, but we have our Cherokee by choice oh, cool. outline cut out here. It's really fun to get pictures with. So if they want to, if you want a picture with uh, Brian and JR and Judy and the team, um, hopefully they'll stick around for a few minutes. Please take advantage of that. It's really fun to do that. And hashtag us if you don't mind. Um, and then, I know, right? Did that for y'all? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's great. Uh, and then I want to announce real quick our, our next speaker in June, um, a fellow by the name of John Blend. Oh yeah. Um, so he he's been in the community for a while. He is the general partner and CEO of Goshen Capital, also the founder of Goshen Valley up there in Canton. His son Zach runs that, but he's a fascinating guy, y'all. He's been in the business for 30 years, um, working in technology companies, starting companies, selling companies. He's been a part of a couple of uh, VC funds, starting and closing them, and they've been wildly successful. But he's passionate about community, and he obviously has a passion for foster kids and kids in need. And so we've asked him to come kind of share his story and love to give you guys access to that. I had coffee with him about two weeks ago, and he said he, he's never really had somebody sit down and ask him to tell a story, which I think that somebody in his 80s, that's really a tragedy. And so I don't know if this is the first time he shared it in public, but regardless, I would just encourage you guys to, if you're interested or you know somebody, tell them to reach out. We'll send up a follow-up email, so if you want to make sure your email's on the list, and we'll send you links on how to get the tickets. So, John Blaine, and uh, that is June 12th, same time. So, thank you all again. We really appreciate it, and y'all feel free to grab some shots and pictures.